Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, uh, I wanted to make a very quick announcement before handing over to Moti. My name's David Telfer, and uh, on behalf of Reed Medem, I wanted to firstly welcome you to the first day of MIPIM. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to make a very quick announcement um, that will be of particular interest to you sat in this room. Uh, the various tweets and blogs um, and posts that you may or may not have already seen have hinted at this already, um, but I've got great pleasure in announcing that Turkey will be the country of honor next year at MIPIM 2013. On my way in, I actually noticed that there's some, uh, some printed news which makes it even more official when you go and have a, a coffee break later. Previously, Poland, France, and the United Kingdom have all been the countries of honor, and this year, Germany uh, is taking center stage. Um, the positive economic and industry growth in Turkey are obviously contributing factors to this, um, and they're the factors that in fact have, have meant that Turkey has this status next year. Uh, I will now uh, hand over to Maite, who will uh, lead you in discussing some of these factors just a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning. Welcome all to our panel. Um, uh, we're just talking about the, with the other panelists that uh, usually Turkey panel uh, has been always been on the uh, last day and the last hour. So this is quite opposite this year. Um, we have um, a distinguished uh, panelist uh, talk about Turkey and uh, uh, specifically reads and um, before handing over to um, to all the speakers, um, let me first uh, introduce you, uh, each one of you. Um, Jane Carson from Renaissance Read, um, Engin Chubukchu, Price for Ross Coopers, and uh, Haluk Sur, um, board member for uh, Emlak Konut Reads. Um, <clears throat> Turkey has been um, performing exceptional in the last um, 10 years. Um, I think it, three weeks ago, I started sending tweets uh, about this panel. They asked me to send some tweets and, uh, on the social media. And if you look at the... Uh, if you look at the tweets that uh, I sent, I think it uh, tells itself um, which country in Europe uh, expects 45 uh, shopping centers um, only in 2012 this year, uh, 1,000 uh, properties in the next uh, three years in the hotel segment, um, 70,000 plus uh, what we call branded projects, um, only in uh, 2012. So all these segments uh, actually shows that um, there is a, uh, something going on in Turkey. Um, if you look at the market um, trends that um, Turkey has, has been performing, uh, GDP, um, uh, we had uh, seen uh, eight percent, six percent, while um, Europe has been going on um, uh, negatives. We do have uh, uh, price stability, um, FDI, um, performing uh, quite good. Um, <coughs> um, when you see the, the fundamentals, obviously the, the macro fundamentals are the population, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, the panelists will touch upon. But um, if you compare the uh, Turkey with other emerging markets rather than the uh, developed countries, uh, I think it has a significant advantage. One of them is the household debt and uh, mortgage rates, uh, still uh, uh, five to six percent of the GDP. Um, REITs in general, 
<coughs> I used um, a table that uh, uh, IPRA uh, has developed and come up with. It shows that the um, they have a, um, a calculation uh, methodology that um, Turkey has about uh, 2,000, um, 219 uh, billion uh, commercial assets. And only if you look at the, the REITs uh, publicly traded, uh, only 3%, 3.5% uh, uh, is the current one. So we still have a lot to go. Um, REITs, um, I'm sure we have uh, panels to touch upon. Um, if you look at the other countries and the emerging markets, especially in emerging Europe, um, the fundamentals actually are quite good. Uh, there is an association for REITs. Uh, uh, Capital Market Board has been around and actually pushing uh, the sector uh, to be more transparent. So all these um, issues uh, made Turkey and the REIT sector specifically uh, is one uh, target in uh, all emerging Europe. Um, so I hand over to Cenk Arson, uh, CEO for Renaissance REIT, and he will share his view on, on the subject. Thank you. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I have to make a quick uh, correction. Uh, Meta called uh, Renaissance as a rate, but unfortunately we are not a rate yet. Uh, last year in May we tried. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in a roadshow in May 2011, but uh, due to the uh, um, unfavorable market conditions we had to postpone. So uh, before talking about uh, rates, I, I would like to uh, give a quick uh, definition of uh, my company, Renaissance Gayrimenkul uh, RGY. Uh, it's a uh, commercial real estate uh, development and investment company active in two markets, Turkey and Russia, uh, mainly focused on two asset class, uh, re uh, retail, retail and uh, office. Uh, as of today, we have uh, around 400,000 square meters of GLA uh, uh, with uh, 34 assets in the portfolio. Uh, with the uh, growth, uh, gross asset value of around 1.7 billion and uh, uh, net EPRA NAV of uh, 1.3 billion. Uh, uh, I think this is uh, our uh, uh, three years uh, pipeline. Uh, we are one of the most active developers in the country. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, last year we tried an IPO, uh, but we had to postpone. Uh, when we look at the rate in Turkey, I'm sure uh, a presenter from Pricewaterhouse uh, uh, will uh, explain in more detail. Uh, but two important things about uh, rate regulation in Turkey. Uh, one is uh, it provides a quite substantial uh, tax benefit, uh, uh, both for the uh, shareholders uh, and the company uh, itself. Uh, there is no uh, corporate tax, 100% uh, 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 tax exemption. Uh, and uh, uh, dividends are also uh, tax exempt, and there are uh, several other transactional uh, tax benefits. So it's a very tax-friendly uh, environment uh, in Turkey, Turkish regulation. Uh, the second important thing about the regulation is, uh, I mean, it's quite uh, investor-friendly as well, uh, uh, with uh, new uh, uh, several restrictions. Uh, it provides uh, a quite transparent uh, reporting system. Uh, and it also, uh, with, with the uh, application of uh, independent board members and uh, each independent board members being one of the uh, uh, com committee members of ethic committee and uh, disclosure committee, corporate governance committee, uh, it's, it, uh, it overall it, cr it creates uh, quite uh, uh, investor friendly uh, environment. Uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, rate law enacted in 2000, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 1995. And since then, uh, 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 24 uh, rates uh, have been listed in the Istanbul Stock Exchange. Uh, total market cap is around 1.3 billion. 
Uh, this is this comprises just three percent of the uh, total market cap market cap of uh, Istanbul Stock Exchange. Uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, the number of rates and both the number of rates and the size of the rates has increased tremendously in the last uh, two three years. Uh, that is mainly because uh, the regulation uh, has changed and. Uh, previously, uh, in order to enjoy the tax benefits, rates should have uh, uh, should have been listed with 49% uh, flotation. But uh, as, uh, CMB has changed this rule and reduced the uh, requirement to 25% uh, free float. And I think that is uh, one of the main uh, triggers uh, why we see uh, quite high number of uh, new rates uh, came to the market. Uh, uh, one uh, significance of the uh, uh, rate industry overall is that although the size is, has increased tremendously in the last couple of years, uh, out of 24 uh, rates uh, publicly listed, 15 has a size of less than 150 million euros. So uh, these, these were mainly uh, uh, rates uh, listed uh, when the uh, law uh, initially enacted just to enjoy the uh, tax benefit. Most of them are mainly static uh, portfolios. Uh, if you look at the uh, composition of the rates, uh, two important thing is uh, one, uh, about uh, two thirds of the uh, portfolio uh, is coming for, is in uh, income generating uh, assets. Uh, the other thing about uh, the composition is uh, two main asset classes are retail and uh, residential. Uh, if you look at the performance as expected, uh, compared uh, uh, relative to Istanbul Stock Exchange uh, Index, as expected, uh, there is a very strong negative correlation between interest rates and uh, relative performance of rates. Uh, when the time interest rates are high, uh, rates uh, underperform. Uh, when the time interest rates are low, uh, uh, rates always uh, overperform in the uh, in the last decade. Uh, 2011, uh, in, 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 tr throughout most of the year, interest rates were low, at, other than the last uh, quarter. So uh, rates were under rates underperformed the market like seven uh, percent. Uh, I will talk about briefly uh, how we see uh, uh, two main markets we are uh, active, two main asset classes uh, we are active, office and uh, uh, retail. First, when we look at the office market, uh, it is uh, worth to underline that uh, it's a very small market. Uh, total stock, uh, Istanbul, first of all, Istanbul is the uh, only real office market in Turkey. Uh, with a total stock of 2.9 million square meters. Uh, Istanbul is a 70 million uh, population city, and 40% of GDP is being created in uh, Istanbul and around Istanbul. Uh, despite these huge numbers, I mean, if you look at, uh, if you compare the office stock of Istanbul with, for example, like Warsaw, which is a city of uh, 2 to 3, three million uh, people, uh, uh, Istanbul stock is uh, even lower than Warsaw, let alone uh, other big cities of uh, Europe. Uh, the main reason of this uh, is because in Turkey, uh, 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 residential uh, flats, apartment flats, uh, can very easily be converted into office uh, uh, area. Uh, and uh, this is the main reason why we have uh, very limited institutional uh, office stock in Istanbul. Uh, but going forward, uh, looking ahead, I mean, uh, we see main, uh, what are the main drivers uh, to support the growth in office market in Turkey. Uh, one is, I mean, two is obvious, uh, two are obvious, GDP growth and uh, FDI uh, inflows. I mean, Meta has mentioned Turkey showed a uh, substantially positive uh, GDP uh, growth performance in the last year, and the expectations are also uh, relatively uh, quite positive. Uh, and the other obvious other trigger is the uh, FDI inflow. Uh, but one thing uh, 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 which we expect to change the uh, game in Turkey uh, uh, Substantially is, uh, the, the, is the fact that uh, with, the, uh, with the increasing number of M&A and consolidation activity in all around the sectors, uh, the companies are getting bigger 
and their number of employees are getting bigger. This will, uh, we expect that this will be a trigger uh, uh, to a major change in the industry uh, to uh, leave the current uh, residential converted office buildings into more institutional A class, B class uh, uh, office buildings. Uh, when we look at the retail market, we see the uh, main drivers are uh, I mean, uh, very uh, positive uh, dynamics of uh, uh, population, uh, socioeconomic situation, and ongoing urbanization, uh, and expanding middle class, uh, and uh, growth in organized uh, retail. Uh, two of them are very uh, important uh, supporters, fundamental supporters of retail growth in Turkey. One is the uh, 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 young population of Turkey, as you all know, uh, like 65-70% uh, uh, six, of Turkish population is uh, below 40 years uh, uh, age. Uh, and uh, per annum uh, population growth is 1.1% in Turkey uh, compared to EU, EU average of 0.4%. I think uh, uh, this provides very strong uh, fundamental uh, for Turkish retail. Um, uh, another important uh, driver uh, for the retail demand is uh, the normalization of, of the economy, because as the norm economy gets normalized, uh, income distribution gets normalized as well. G co uh, Gini coefficient is uh, normalized, and uh, this has a, a major effect, uh, in a major positive effect in the in the both the number of the and the in, uh, income level of the uh, middle like, middle and affluent segment of the uh, population. Uh, for example, in Turkey, we calculate uh, that there are uh, 21 million people in the uh, middle uh, income segment. In the next 10 years, if economy continues to grow on average like 3 to 4 percent, in the next 10 years, we expect to have another 13 uh, million people to be included in the uh, middle income segment of the population. And that's obviously a, a huge uh, uh, driver for retail. Uh, 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 another important driver for retail is the uh, household debt. Uh, I mean, the, the chart on the left-hand side, as you can see, I mean, uh, uh, overall indebtedness of the Turkish household is, uh, is the lowest among its uh, uh, peers and, uh, in, uh, in European, uh, compared to European, uh, most of the European countries. Uh, this obviously... Uh, 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 creates uh, a much bigger uh, spendable income uh, uh, for the uh, Turkish people. And that's uh, exact, actually we think uh, is the single most important uh, driver uh, behind the uh, recent positive uh, development of uh, retail consumption in Turkey, uh, which can be uh, followed on the uh, right-hand side uh, slide. Uh, despite the economic uh, fluctuations, uh, ups and downs in the last couple of years, uh, in Turkey, uh, retail turnovers uh, has been uh, constantly uh, increasing. Okay, these are all uh, positive, but I mean, uh, as uh, you have uh, so far seen in most of the uh, uh, slides about uh, Turkish retail development, uh, there has been a tremendous uh, investment boom in the shopping centers in the last 10 years. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, stock uh, has increased from less than 1 million to more than 8 million, eight folds increase. Uh, and uh, if you look at the pipeline on the second, uh, on the uh, right hand side slide, uh, uh, on top of uh, the huge increase in the investment in the last uh, decade, uh, Turkey has the second biggest pipeline uh, in the sh shopping center uh, development in Europe. So, I mean, uh, when you put these together, obviously, uh, this is a bit uh, scary. Uh, but what uh, made us uh, a bit uh, comfortable, of course, I mean, in, in major cities, in certain areas, there, are, uh, there is oversupply uh, problem. Uh, but if you look at the overall picture, uh, retail density, uh, GLA per uh, thousand inhabitants, Turkey is still uh, much below than Hungary, Romania, uh, and uh, most of the other uh, European uh, countries. So uh, all, all in all, uh, we believe uh, there is still uh, growth opportunity in retail in Turkey. Uh, uh, as to the conclusion, I mean, we believe there are strong fundamentals uh, in Turkey, especially in retail, but to a lesser extent in office as well. 
Uh, and plus, there is a uh, supportive regulatory framework uh, for rates. So we believe uh, there is a value opportunity, value proposition uh, for uh, investors uh, into Turkish rates. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, speaking of size and um, reads, obviously, uh, first thing comes to mind is uh, Emlak Konut. Uh, Emlak Konut is, um, for those you know, uh, um, is um, uh, a world size uh, uh, real, uh, real estate investment trust. Um, it actually uh, uh, has two heads. Uh, one acting as a REIT. Uh, secondly, it actually acts like um, uh, um, uh, a, a motive for other um, developers. Um, so I hand over to uh, Haluk Sur to talk about that um, more in detail. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session concerning Turkish rates. Good morning to all of you. This is the this is one of the earliest sessions under the umbrella of MIPIM 2012. I hope this show will bring a lot of good things and benefits to your companies and to your uh, countries. Uh, <coughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about review about the Emlak REIT Real Estate Investment Trust Company. And if you have further questions, I'll be ready to answer you. Emlak Konut became a real estate investment company in 2012. And the company particularly focused on middle and upper middle income groups, developments. And also, the company is the largest rig in Turkey by property portfolio and size of the land bank and the market value, with an amount of 5.88 billion Turkish liras as of February 24, 2012. And the total asset size is almost 7 billion Turkish liras, something like 4 billion US dollars. And Emlak Konut as being an affiliation, the largest affiliation of Toki, uh, can acquire land from Toki's portfolio without joining a tender, and this is the main privilege of the company. This is one of the earliest projects developed by Emlak Konut under the revenue share model with the private sector company. I want to review some of the figures uh, concerning the Emlak Rig. From starting from 2003 up to the up to this date, almost 63,000 housing units uh, have either been completed or developed and still under construction. And since 2002, the aggregate tender worth has been valued as almost 20 billion Turkish dollars, something like 12 billion US dollars. That was the volume of the job created by Emna Konut. And Emna Konut has two basic models in the operations. One of them is the revenue share model, we call it as RSM. And the share of RSM projects within this value is almost 19 billion, majority of the total operations and the projects developed by the company. And the second uh, type of operation is public procurement model, we call it as PP PPM, as shortly. And the PPM project size is uh, 
550 million US Turkish liras. And since 2002, tendered and projected land has been reached to 4.5 million square meters from the company's land bank. And again, 3.67 million square meter of land for RSM projects and the remaining for public procurement model. So far, uh, Emnekont has developed 58 projects and 29 of them has been completed and handed over to the client, having, the, having 26,000 units within those 29 completed projects. And another 29 tendered and ongoing projects we have. And these ongoing projects, still under construction, uh, consist of 22,000 22, units. So altogether, it makes almost like 48, 49,000 units. But, but as I told you earlier that we have developed 63,000. So we have some tendered projects, but we haven't started to uh, build the construction yet since we do not get the construction permits from the local authorities. But in very soon period of time, also they will be ongoing projects. Again, during this period of time, MNACONT has undertaken, undertaken 58 projects and cooperate with more than 33 major contractors in Turkey. And 21 out of those contractors are still involved in the ongoing projects. This is again one of the earliest projects developed by the company with the private sector company under the RSM model called as Apil Court, Ateşehir Istanbul. Uh, on the slide you see the uh, post-IPO ownership structure. TOKI, State Housing Development Authority of Turkey, has holds the majority of the shares, almost 75%, and 25% is floating. Company uh, went for IPO at the end of 2010, and it was one of the most successful IPOs in the capital market history of Turkey. Uh, and the money came, flew, flew, flew into the company, reached to 850 million US dollars. And after the global crisis of 2008, that was one of the largest fundraising and IPOs and within top three globally. This is again one of the projects developed by the company in Izmir, third largest city in Turkey, on the aging coast. You can observe some of the uh, key financials of the company. Change in the net sales and EBITDA margins. EBITDA margins varies for the RSM and PPM type of projects. If it is RSM, it may reach up to 40, 50%. As an average, we should say 35 to 40%. If it is PPM type of deal, something like 20 to 25%. And it shows also the total assets on the picture. I should mention a little bit about RSM projects and PPM projects, what they are. Uh, Emnacont acts as a landowner in the revenue share model RSM projects and takes no direct construction or marketing risk and acts as a trustee body between the development company, private development company and the uh, home buyers. The turnover exceeds the committed revenue is paid to MNAC Konut according to the revenue share ratio, which is stated on the tender agreement. Shortly, this model, RSM model, provides downside protection for the earnings of the company and keeps upside potential. Approximately 80% of the overall business is sourced from the RSM uh, projects. For the PPM type of projects, public procurement model, 
Emnakont operates the financing, marketing, sales and book all the revenues on its account and takes all the risk. And the contractor merely constructs the project only. It's like a subcontracting. And approximately 20% of the overall business are sourced from PPM-based projects. Mete, I think we saved the previous one. Anyway, uh, on this slide you see the housing demand in Turkey. It, it's the average value is something like 600, 650,000 units per annum, which comes from the population growth. But there are main key driving factors in the residential business in Turkey, and I should say, uh, first of it is the population growth, and the second thing is migration. Still, there is migration from rural areas to urban areas. The urbanization rate in Turkey is almost 72% currently, and to adapt country herself to European Union standards, uh, Turkey aims to reach up to 85% means we have to displace and replace 13% of the total population and Turkish population is almost 75 million. As a result of this migration we have to uh, make, we have to bring more than 10 million people from rural areas, from small uh, living places to uh, larger cities, to metropolitan cities or, or to regional centers and it will bring another uh, demand uh, to the residential sector. Third, last but not the least one, the renewal of the current housing stock. We call it as urban regeneration, and that's the, that will be the main driving factor in the Turkish residential sector in very soon period of time. Also, Turkish government declared some new uh, agenda concerning the uh, replacement regeneration of the current stock. The current housing stock in Turkey almost is 19 million units, and 48% of this current stock is over the age of 35 years old. So it means we have to renew at least 8 to 10 million uh, housing units to uh, make it uh, sustainable and also uh, compatible to earthquake effects and resilient to earthquake effects. And also to uh, create a better living spaces for the Turkish citizens. And altogether, it will create a huge uh, volume of business in front of us. Of course, the fourth one is uh, now, again, is in, it's a very hot issue in Turkey, is the reciprocity matter, which will bring a lot of uh, demand from the Gulf region to, uh, to Turkey, from the Gulf region country citizens to Turkey. Also, it will be a very important phenomenon to uh, trigger the residential development in Turkey. And this is the, one of the latest, latest projects developed by Emnak Konut with the private sector company Variap, called as Variap Meridian. This is the first uh, lead registered mixed-use complex in Turkey and uh, still under construction. As far as I uh, know, the, the completion rate will be a, a year ahead, and it will be a, a lead silver certified uh, complex in Turkey. And on this slide, you see the changes uh, in the residential sales in Emnak Konut, independent unit sales, starting from 2004. And the figure in 2011 reached up to uh, 12,658 units, almost double of 2010 and triple of 2009. So this is a good thing, I hope. And the minimum and guaranteed cash flow revenue to the company for the next three years, will reach to uh, 4.5 billion Turkish liras. And when you look at the, compare the 
past performances of the revenue share model projects, it may easily reach up to 6 billion Turkish liras revenue. This is guaranteed, not guaranteed, the guaranteed one, the minimum one is 4.5 million, but this is an estimation. It may reach up to 6, mil, 6 billion Turkish liras. And the profit of the Emna Konut from this revenue will be something like 3.5 3 billion Turkish liras. And uh, for the next three years, until the end of 2014. Even though Emnakon doesn't do anything else from now on, this is the money which will flow to the company. Thank you very much for listening. Actually, there were some other slides, but I think they uploaded the uh, previous uh, slides and presentation to the computer. So if you have some further questions after the conclusion of the uh, speeches, I'm ready to answer you. Thank you very much. Um, to make the best uh, for the rest of the uh, panel, we have uh, 20 minutes, so I'll uh, ask Engin uh, uh, Bey to come and um, do the presentation, and then we'll do a, um, a Q&A session. Uh, the rest of the uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Good morning and thank you. I will try to make it as quick as possible to leave some time for your questions to the panelists. And my presentation today will cover uh, what's happening in the real estate sector in Turkey at the moment and what are the expectations and opportunities and in light of these to understand and evaluate the opportunities and challenges that faces the rate sector in Turkey. In terms of understanding what a rate means, we first should understand the market dynamics in Turkey. And after that, to understand the rate, there are certain pillars to the story actually. One is the accounting principle, the other one is the regulatory background and the transparency. The other will be the taxation perspective. And putting all these together, the investors and developers can make an assessment of a rate and what it means for them. In terms of what's happening in the market by the last quarter of 2011 and this first quarter of 2012, the first point that I would like to stress is the decrease in mortgage loans. There has been a drop starting from the third quarter with the interest rate increases. Actually, the major reason of the interest rate increase was the concerns on the European crisis and also the current account deficit of Turkey. And this led to a 300 basis point of increase in government bonds in just a month. So this rate increases has been reflected to the credit market and also the deposits and other interest rates. However, what's interesting is that after a normalization of the interest rates in the last month, this has not been reflected to the credit markets. And this also shows the reluctancy of the finance institutions to lend more in 2012. So one of the biggest challenges would be the financing side of the story where financial institutions are very reluctant to lend in 2012. Our expectation of credit growth is around 10 to 15% in 2012, which is much less than 2011. The second point is the foreign investment in real estate. The total 2 billion uh, in 2011 includes the foreign investors purchasing real persons and also the foreign direct investments. This 2 billion US dollars has been lower than what has happened in 2010 and 9. So although our surveys and all discussions with foreign investors shows that Turkey is a great opportunity and as explained by the other attendees that there are significant population and penetration dynamics which supports this, we still have not seen that opportunity turn into investment yet. So. This is also some negative points in 2012. And the strong consumption, which was earlier mentioned, is still continuing in Turkey, together with the GDP growth. But when you look at the shopping mall 
segment of the real estate, you see that there's a significant GLA increase. So this kind of offsets the turnover per meter square, and we are stable on that for this period. For office markets, we see that there is a strong uh, dynamic and there is strong investment, and this investment keeps the rental rate stable at the moment. So when you look at this picture, you see either some decreasing or stable trends in real estate markets in Turkey. But on the other side of the story, we should look at what's going to happen or what's expected in the market in the coming year and years. The first point would be the 2B land creation. The 2B land creation will help the companies to create land much easier. And this ease in terms of land creation will help the supply side of the story. The urban transformation, which is strongly supported by the government, will help and create a big opportunity for residential and other types of investments in the real estate sector. Thirdly, the foreign ownership. There is a law changing some rules of the foreign ownership, and this will open a door for new demand and new foreign investment for us. And we see that as a very opportunity, big opportunity for the real estate market. The strong GDP growth is still continuing. The expected growth rate is 4 to 5 percent in 2012. So the demand and the consumption uh, will still be strong. And lastly, the new Turkish commercial code will be in effect starting from this uh, July. And this will create transparency for the companies. This will create an environment where the financial information and go corporate governance will be more in effect in Turkey. So this will also support the foreign direct investment, also create a business environment where the fair uh, competition will be much more easy. So in light of these, the major problem regarding the rate sector and the real estate sector actually would be the financing. So can rate regulation be a solution to this financing problem, the scarcity of the finances? Because in terms of foreign direct investment, the crisis in Europe and the reluctancy of also the financial institutions in Europe to lend to real estate also affects Turkey. And the local markets, due to increasing uh, regulation and also lack of finance to be created by the local banks, uh, we see that there will be a shortage of finance in these times of opportunity. So the ones who can use the finance, can finance themselves long term with uh, lower rates, will be in favor. So let's see what rate regulation means and we can go on how about this financing can be created through rates. The rates are regulated by the Capital Markets Board, which is a well established institution in Turkey and has significant experience in terms of regulating the markets. There are 24 active rates and five in progress, totaling up to a market cap of 7 billion. And at least 25% of the shares of a rate should go public in an initial public offering. So this is the first point on financing. If you become a rate, you have to go to public and this will create the long term uh, low financing cost for you. So this is the first point. And 25% is the minimum rate, so you can uh, go public on a higher rates. One of the founders should be the leading investor in a rate structure. So this creates the certain requirements on that investor. And what this means for other investors is that there is a more regulated environment. And that person is responsible for many things. So it creates a regulated environment for the foreign investor. You can either establish a rate as a new company or transform a company into a rate. And the transformation process, although takes some time, is not very difficult. In terms of taxation, rates are exempt from corporate tax. They have a 100% exemption. So you pay zero corporate tax. And in terms of dividend distribution, there are no withholding taxes on the dividend. So this is another big advantage of the rates. In terms of valuation standards, all the valuations in the portfolio are done by Capital Mark Sports Certified Appraisers. This creates at least a standard and a regulatory body who is in charge of this environment. 
Accounting standards are Turkish financial reporting standards, which is identical with international financial reporting standards. So the financial information created is uh, literate to all the global players, and it's very comprehensive. In terms of uh, segregation, the developer and the construction business are totally segregated in the rate structure. So this helps uh, the investor and the developer to be uh, outside some legal aspects and problems, structural problems of the construction sector. There are specific rules on capital markets board on the assets that can be included in the portfolio. This is actually done to protect the investor from some legal and entitlement pro uh, problems of certain uh, buildings or real estate investments in Turkey. And since the Capital Markets Board is in charge of this, uh, the entitlement problems and the legal problems that an investor can face when investing into a rate is very minimal. And it's subject to independent audit semi-annually. So you have a third party which is uh, doing the insight uh, job for you, an external auditor control. And all the sales, purchase, and lease transactions are subject to valuation. So there is a great transparency in the regulation. And you can easily track all the sale, purchase, and lease transaction to a third party valuation, independent valuation. Putting all these together, actually, we can make a brief summary of the advantages and disadvantages, both for the investor and from the developer side. From the developer side, the first advantage is the access to public funds through the initial public offering, which can be minimum 25%. You can also use alternative financing instruments, such as covered bonds and other stuff. And the system works as uh, when you have the trade receivables in a rate, you can put them as a collateral pool and use it in your financing to issue a covered bond, which is also a regulated market by the capital market sport. So this creates an alternative and a cheap way of financing your activities. You have a tax advantage and a corporate governance in this regulation, which would help the company in a long-term basis. The downsides from a developer's perspective can be the high discounts observed in the last IPOs. In a couple of uh, one or two years, some IPOs have been with 30 to 40 percent discounts, which has been very uh, disappointing for certain companies who are planning to do IPOs in this uh, market. It's a very regulated business, so this can affect certain companies' way of business. Some companies may have to adjust their operating ways into this regulation. And some assets may not qualify for the portfolio and this uh, CMB requirements. And this can be a difficult issue when you have to consider the IPO or going to a rate structure. From investors' perspective, the advantages are you have an international financial reporting standards. There is a significant transparency, strong regulatory control, a professional real estate management. It's, of course, more liquid, and of course, there's an opportunity to capitalize on the market fluctuations. The negative side would be that the market is not mature yet, and maybe the reason of the panel's name is the top of the iceberg. There's a significant real estate market in Turkey, but rates constitute a very small portion of this. And this uh, market being not so deep can create some fair value uh, problems when you are dealing with the market. And also consistent application of the valuation standards may sometimes be an issue, but this is regulated by the Capital Markets Board and together with the players such as the investors and the regulator, I believe that these problems can be resolved going forward. So this is my assessment of the rate structure and would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Use the micro. Um, <clears throat> I have one question relating with the probably to all panels. Um, the uh, reads are uh, traded, um, as you already mentioned on the uh, presentation, um, traded uh, with a discount. Uh, what would be the reason? Is um, 
the early uh, examples uh, which they call static uh, might be the reason. And, uh, what is it that is it the counter risk? What exactly do you see the, um, the reason or the engine way uh, to overcome for the newcomers? Well, I would first agree with. I would first agree with the fact that the previous uh, examples sometimes can be very misleading for the investors. Also, the timing of the IPO is very important in terms of the discounts. And another factor would be the transparency. Actually, uh, the valuation standards and the valuation valuators, independent valuators that we are using should be very reliable to give the confidence to the investor. And also, Finally, I believe that the story of the Turkish market and the company should be told much better to the investor in the roadshows and etc. Because sometimes we see that very prospective uh, investors have been sold with significant discounts. And I believe that this has something to do with overrated uh, country risk of Turkey and the companies, which should be overcome by better explaining ourselves uh, to the foreign investors, actually. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? I also have another question. Um, as, um, the, as the industry uh, progress, uh, we see um, um, Newcomers for uh, not just um, the usual suspects, the uh, residential office, but uh, new alternative uh, real estate investments like the student housing, uh, elderly housing, um, marinas, uh, even the techno parks. Um, and I uh, personally know uh, that uh, a lot of um, funds are looking to Turkey. Uh, because of the fundamentals, strong fundamentals, especially on this, um, this um, um, uh, new alternative uh, investments. Uh, do you think that would be um, um, a new um, way out uh, going forward? And would that be end up in the uh, uh, portfolio of any REITs? Looking, looking at the strong fundamentals, for sure there is opportunities for the alternative asset classes. Uh, but for my company, I mean, we see uh, enough opportunity in office and uh, retail side. Uh, we, for the foreseeable future, we plan to focus on these two asset classes. But more and more, we see people, investors, developers are coming and uh, doing business on the alternative asset class side. But as of today, I think the size of that market is uh, substantially lower than the usual content, uh, usual office re retail and residential markets. Um, we also um, see a lot of um, um, reads in the market uh, currently traded. Uh, they do um, not only, uh, they don't have specific um, obviously, the exceptions are um, Ray Sash doing only the logistics and Akfen only doing uh, hotels. Um, do we expect um, or will that be a preferable one uh, to, uh, to see more focused, uh, dedicated team only doing uh, one thing? Uh, will that have a uh, positive effect on the uh, on the performance of the REITs as well? To concentrate on a certain type of asset class is, is another type of uh, operation in the REIT sector in Turkey, as you said before, Akfen and Reysaj. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time, when you look at the whole globe, the number of the countries reached to 32, 33 globally, uh, which have the REIT regulation and 
most of those in most of those countries the uh, the, the the varieties of the reeds mainly concentrate on the uh, mixed type of asset or hybrid type of assets uh, i mean they may uh, concentrate or create a portfolio from different asset classes residential retail or offices of course there are some certain uh, type of reeds mainly uh, concentrate on the specific topic issue uh, but it's a still growing and evolving uh, concept on the whole globe uh, I should give a couple of figures if we have time uh, from the EPRA resources the size of the capital market boards the volume of the capital market boards in June 2007 was 55 trillion US dollars and the volume of the underwritten uh, institutional real estate transactions were something like 17 trillion US dollars at the same time the uh, volume of the real estate companies listed in the stock exchange uh, markets globally the size of the uh, market caps was 1.2 uh, billion trillion US dollars then we uh, come to uh, October uh, 2011 the volume of the stock exchange markets dropped down to 44 trillion US dollars after the global crisis of 2008 but at the same period of time this is a very significant matter the volume of the underwritten institutional let transactions globally reached up to 24 trillion US dollars from 17 to 24 trillion US dollars and the uh, volume of the listed real estate companies reached from 1.2 trillion dollars up to 2, 2 trillion dollars as of October 2011 and we understood the tendency of the investors during the global crisis converted to change from different type of investment classes to real estate and it shows how big import how important to have real estate investments to protect your uh, investments and to have a shelter against uh, economic crisis and that was very important issue i guess and in turkey in the real sector of course there is an evolution the first uh, read came into the stock exchange market in year 1996 as being a like but f for a long period of time till the mid 2000 because of uh, financial economic crisis in Turkey and the big earthquake in 1999 and the structure and the main entrepreneur of the early rich companies in Turkey Changed a lot of uh, uh, played a lot of role in the evolution of the REIT, and as Jenk said in his uh, presentation, 15 out of 23 REIT company in Turkey have uh, one less than one million US dollars portfolio size. When we look at the Emnak REIT uh, example, it's a very specific and unique example, really. I think size matters in the REIT sector. If you have a liquid and a capital market board or stock exchange market depth in your stock, in your shares, it gives a lot of confidence to the international investors, as far as my mind is concerned. And the size is very important, and the pricing during the IPO uh, is another very critical issue. We shouldn't be so much greedy to get or to collect more and more money from the investors in early days. The pricing is the main issue which uh, triggers the intention uh, of the and the concentration of the international investors towards your IPO. And the second thing or third thing, I think the dividend distribution is very critical 
matter. Yes, according to the read regulation, read, reads are uh, allowed not to distribute any dividend to the share, to the shareholders. But at the end of the day, it created a big problem for the evolution of the T reads in the past. I think the all the REIT companies in the stock exchange market from now on, on, on and all the newcomers should concentrate to pay dividend as cash, not as bonus shares for the future. It will again affect, influence the international investors towards REIT companies in the stock exchange market. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question before we close the panel? All right. <laughs> Thank you uh, for joining us, and I wish you all a happy MIPIM experience. Um, thank you. <laughs>